member of the big Duke family, and I think I really feel privileged to be part of that. So, as Mark says, I just took the directorship uh, in Singapore, and but today, of course, I'm only two months into my new job, so nothing comes from research associated with the Duke and US. So this is all research that I have been uh, doing with uh, the, the CSR Australian Animal Health Laboratory. So I thought I would cover sort of three different areas. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many people know about uh, backbone viruses, so I thought I'd just give you a very brief <coughs> overview and I'd pick some of the more high-profile ones. And then really to address the, the, the key question we are really interested in now is, are bats special as a reservoir for viruses? Okay. I mean, um, our group is not the only one working on this internationally. It's pretty hot right now. And then give you some idea of what I think will be the future directions for my group because uh, I have actually still 30% uh, joint employment with organizations. So the, all the high containment work will be done in Australia and the more basic research to do with this science will be done in Singapore. That's my own sort of research plan. Okay, so let's start with the bat borne viruses. You know, as Mark says, I was trained as a, a biochemist at UC Davis in molecular biology, so I know nothing about bats until we really bump into bat borne viruses. So these are the sort of facts, bat facts, I think it would be useful for the audience is just to appreciate that uh, 20% of all living mammals on Earth are bats. Sorry, this is getting warm. I have to take off my jacket here. This place is a bit warm. Okay, so 20%, one out of five uh, mammals on um, Earth are bats. In terms of species and, and general diversity, is only second to rodents. And uh, they're the only really sort of flying mammals. You know, there are mammals can climb sort of up and then glide down, but they're not truly flying. So bats are the only mammal that has a true flying capability. And they're, they're more widely distributed than any other mammals. So the only place that you don't, cannot find bats are uh, in Antarctic. And uh, variable thermal regulation is also important that, uh, of course, we know micro bats can go to you know, hibernation. And, uh, but some bats can also have a daily toggle. The temperature really uh, varies very rapidly from 37 to sub 10. And the last three, I think, is the most interesting to our research right now. One is the longevity. Okay, so again, I have, I'm not expert in this area, but I have been sort of uh, uh, told that a, a seven gram micro bat lives to 41 years. So if you translate into human years, the bat is more than 1,000 years old. Okay. And it's interesting because if you look at the theory of aging, it has to do with, you know, DNA damage and uh, oxidative pressure. So bats as a flying mammal, you think that they have very fast metabolic rate. So you think that they are under more oxidative pressure than land mammals. So somehow during evolution, they can handle this and live really long. Anecdotally, you know, I always try to develop cell line I'm gonna to touch later, and we try to collaborate with bat biologists all over the world and looking for tumor tissues. And uh, they keep telling me, you know, in their whole life, they haven't found any bats with tumor. Of course, if you go to literature, there might be three or four papers dealing with bat tumors, that's it. So it uh, seems to have a low sort of tumor genesis. And last, of course, is the area we're most interested, at least for the last 20 years or so, you know, they're increasingly recognized as a reservoir for a large number of different viruses. And that certainly is the focus of our research. But if you think of bats and the viruses, I think, uh, you know, it's not new. That association, you know, so far, Still, one of the most important zoonotic viruses is rabies virus. I don't know if anybody in the audience studied rabies, but uh, certainly that's the association was made then 100 years ago, so it's nothing is new. But we do have a new wave of sort of emergence or recognition, if you like, and that was triggered by the, the sort of discovery in Australia that it's the Hendra virus in 94. So I think I need to just do a little bit. I mean, this is almost 20 years old, but for us, it almost feels like yesterday. It's, uh, so there was a pretty large outbreak, you know, in Australia, anything then sort of two uh, animal deaths is large, you know, it's such a clean island country. We don't have nasty diseases, you know, among animals or wildlife. So in this case, there was 20 horses. So these are no ordinary horses. This are uh, from a stable with racing horses, each was like half a million. So when you have 20 horses comes down with acute respiratory disease, and 13 of them die, and then two of the so for the trainer and the horse stable hand, all the property also came down with disease and one of them died. So 
in Australia, that's considered really big. You know, so the federal government, the equivalent of FBI, our sort of agency was involved in thinking that's sabotage because that guy is rich and famous. And the material was sent down to our lab, which is a national sort of laboratory uh, for animal health. And uh, sort of, it's Murphy's Law, you always receive important specimens on Friday night, you know. So, but we have a system that uh, we work in 24 hours, you know. So, as I said, for emerging infectious disease sort of a facility like ours, so we consider ourselves it's like army, you know. We have peacetime and wartime. Wartime is when you have outbreak like this, and we work three shifts in the 24 hours. So we put the uh, specimen, the horse tissues, into different cell line, and by Tuesday, Monday, we saw a CPE, and then Tuesday, we put the material back into horses, and by Friday next week, and all horses, experiment horses, die. So that was uh, Fred Murphy, sort of in the science paper, really commented that in the history of mouse hunting, this is the most sort of rapid response. Within two weeks, you identify the agent, and uh, you fulfill the uh, Cox postulate to say that's the virus which is responsible for the death in both human and horses. Okay, so as I said, this is the first human victim and without him we would not have discovered the Hendra virus because he is very high profile, rich and he has a lot of horses and in that particular case 13 died and 7 has to be put down because once it's Hendra positive, the current government policy is whether it's PCR positive, zero positive, any animal except human has to be sacrificed. <laughs> and uh, I just want to do a little bit of sort of, uh, in terms of, I don't know if any of the virologists that you have been facing with this problem, because in my group we have discovered so many viruses in the last 10 years, so we ran out of really sort of idea for naming. So the safe way is that, so the, when the virus was first discovered in the science paper, it was discovered as an equine mobility virus, okay? So when I did the genome sequence, I said that's definitely not a mobility virus. It's too distant. It looks like a new virus in the family. And then also we discovered it's not a host virus. As I will tell later, it's from bat. So I changed the name to Hendra viruses. But I think uh, I can safely <coughs> say here in, in, in USA that I was responsible for the name change. But in Australia, I have to hide myself because the residents in Hendra got really angry, you know. <laughs> 20 years, almost 20 years later, this real estate agent in Hendra is still sort of demanding a name change because they blame me for the job of their property house, you know. Yeah, so, but seriously, that, that's how now we name viruses because I think the ICTV, the International Committee for Virus Taxonomy, already banned naming virus after the victim or the scientist. You know, I don't mind it called lymphus virus, but it's not allowed, you know. So we have to name after something. So traditionally, we just name out of the, in this case, the place. So Hendra is the first uh, where the stable was for the first outbreak. Okay, so 94 September was the, we thought was the in this case, but retrospectively, one month before that, and you know, Australia is a big country, so it's in the same state of Queensland, 800 kilometers further south in the place of Mackay, a vet was called nighttime. Two horses died of undiagnosed symptoms. And in you know, far back Australia, the vets could not do postmortem. So she invited her husband to drive a ute and uh, use the headlight as sort of the nighttime sort of uh, lighting. And then he helped with postmortem. And then he came down with uh, acute respiratory disease, recovered. Fifteen months later, he hospitalized and died of encephalitis. And a specimen was sent to our lab. Retrospectively, we confirmed that he actually, so from the serum taking uh, in August of 94, and also the brain specimen 95, both confirmed actually he died of Hendra. So retrospectively, actually, there were two cases in 94, and somehow we had a gap. In 99, we had one, and another gap, 2004. But since 2006, every year we will see at least two outbreaks. When we define outbreaks, at least one horse die. You know, sometimes you have a human, like 2007, 2008, we also have human deaths. And by 2010, that reduced, you know, although two to one, but it's a 50% reduction. We thought we were doing really well because uh, we will try to educate the vets to say, please use your PPE and also horse owners, you know, if you see any sick horses, please don't get near. So we thought we were doing really well until last year. We had 18 outbreaks in one year. You know, that's just really difficult. We, could not, we still could not explain this. 
All we know is that from all the virus isolation, all the sequence we have done, there's a, you know, of course you don't have a single strain, right? You have different variants circulating in the bat population in Australia. Virologically, we cannot see which one is more lethal, or more transmissible. And plus, this 18 events is caused by multiple variants of virus, not a single sequence. And also in Australia, you know, it's, you know, can be geographically, the, the size of outbreaks can be a thousand kilometers apart. So something happened in the bat population, the other the ecology, the physiology, which triggers that spike of the event. So that's really the focus of our research in collaboration with other groups. This is really looking at the host rather than the viruses. The other unique stuff in 2011 is now we have a domestic pet, a pet dog, at least one of the dogs, because we don't routinely do serology or PCR on dogs because uh, it's pretty sensitive if you get positive. So we have a volunteer sort of a policy to say if on your property, if horse or human get positive, then we're willing to test any animals you have, but it's not compulsory. Okay, so that particular property that uh, they send, you know, horses, samples, and a human, dog, cat, everything, and we got a positive dog. And so that caused a lot of anxiety nationally because uh, the policy is we have to put down that dog, although it's uh, without any symptom, but it's a zero positive. The question is that, that in future now, in all future outbreaks, then dogs will be tested as well. And uh, so what's different in 2011? We really don't know. So it's a $12 million question because the government was so nervous that uh, say what happens if this is going to be on the trend of increasing and they want to not, unfortunately that 20, 12 million does not come to, to, to my life, it's more for the field scientists who are working on the bat ecology and the bat physiology, try to understand what happened in the bat population. Okay, so what's the situation this year? Certainly much worse than previous years, but not as bad as last year. So it's interesting, the Hendra season is in winter in Australia goes from May and usually sort of tears off in October, November. So we are at the sort of the tail end of this. But last week we had our seventh outbreak this year, so it's still pretty bad. And we had a two sort of human cases with high risk exposure. Unfortunately, they did not uh, succumb to the disease. The second virus I'm going to describe is uh, something that uh, Mike mentioned in the introduction is uh, much more high profile because it. It's a highly related virus called a Nipper virus. So now they just went ahead with the naming of the village that the index case in Malaysia was first discovered. So it caused the outbreak in Malaysia and through live pig import into Singapore. So this, in Singapore, they also had a human cases and a death. A total of around 300 people involved in this outbreak is much bigger than in Australia. And the mortality rate was around 40%. Okay. And in that particular sort of uh, outbreak, we already had uh, evidence. We knew the dogs are susceptible because uh, we had a positive dog has to be more than 100 has to be put down. And pig is the main amplifier host and the transmission host to control the disease. You know, you wipe up 95% of pig population in Malaysia. Okay. And uh, so this is the Nipper Malaysia virus that uh, does not have human to human transmission. Whereas we have another Nipper virus, a different strain, we call Nipper virus of Bangladesh. Now that outbreak, so the first detect outbreak is 2001, but uh, it happens now almost on an annual basis. And uh, so the difference this time is that uh, this virus some, somehow has a high mortality and has the ability of human to human transmission. But we don't believe it's a difference in virus. It's more the sort of the social and economic situation, the hygiene and the, the uh, like traditionally, you know, in Bangladesh, when people are dying, they sort of noting them very, very closely and the religious leaders go there to touch the patients and then the kisses everybody in the family and that's sort of caused the transmission. Whereas in Malaysia, most of the sick patients were isolated in the isolation unit in the hospital. And we just have a paper being accepted by EID. One of my PhD students did that experiment in Farage, as lead, at least with these two viruses, and we did not find any difference in transmission in the ferret model. And the ferret model, by the way, is the best model mimicking human infection right now. And then I don't think we need any introduction for this audience in terms of the SARS, and it's a severe sort of a, a abbreviation that's for the severe acute respiratory syndrome, and it's caused by a novel coronavirus, which that uh, we have never seen before the SARS outbreak, okay? 
And uh, I think the most important is that uh, the, the, the economic impact globally, the most conservative one is 50 billion, and some goes as high as 250 billion. And then Ebola and the marble virus, these are in the sort of same order as pyramidal virus, but different family in the field of virulence. These are not new viruses. It's been around, you know, since uh, in the 70s. And uh, so they, they, Ebola used to be considered as the most deadly virus until recently we collaborated with uh, Tom Geisberg's group. We put a Hendra virus into non-human primates. And then he told us that uh, the Hendra virus, Hendra Nipper virus, kills non-human primates even faster than the Ebola virus. So these guys are certainly all BSF-4 agents. You know. So what do they have in common? And uh, for virologists, it's interesting they're all RNA viruses. But for us, of course, that the, the second observation is equally or more important is that all these viruses come from bats, okay? And then all of them really are high containment sort of pathogens and uh, I put up three slash four there because all the viruses are listed are BSF-4 pathogens in Australia, including SARS, because we did not have a single human case. So when we approached for the, to the government for importation, they made a condition to say, you can only do that if you treat this as a BSF-4. But in other countries like USA and you know, other uh, European nations, is considered as a three plus, you know, so. Okay, so they are also high impact viral pathogens, not in terms of the, you know, they're the killers, but uh, you also get a uh, high impact publications, you know, so, and our group was to sort of respond for the, the first three, the Hanger, SARS, Nipper, we didn't, we were not involved with the Ebola study. Although now we're, we're doing some Ebola resting work that uh, it's the, the only Ebola virus not coming from the African sort of a continent, it's in the Philippines, and we believe it's a back to private transmission, but 20, 2008, the virus get into the pig population, so the virus is capable of having a pig-to-pig -pig transmission. So WHO basically commissioned us to do an infection study. So we are doing Ebola, but it's not the Zaire, the Western sort of strain. So I'm not going to go to any more viruses, but I try to say that uh, you know, start with Hendra, and we go all the way down. So I just arbitrarily list 20 viruses, you know, a little bit more important than the others. And the blue color indicates all these viruses that have already been confirmed as zoonotic that has already caused infection in humans, and most of them are severe infections or death. And then the red color indicates the virus that are discovered by our group or we play a major role internationally and the sort of in characterization. And I just mentioned the last virus just published last month in cross pathogen we call a CEDA virus. So as you can see, all these viruses are named you know, after locations now, Tierman, Menango, Nelson Bay, Malacca, very exotic names, some are in Australia, some are in Malaysia and other places. So the CEDA virus is interesting because as I said, the Hannibal virus are considered now one of the most lethal virus to humans sort of uh, 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 even could be more lethal than filoviruses. So we still don't understand why it kills so rapidly. Okay, so in terms of the pathogenesis, we try to get a handle onto that. So one way of doing this is to do reverse genetics and you start to mutate the virus and try to make one non-pathogenic. And nature did that for us. So last year we discovered in our surveillance in uh, sort of Australia for the bat viruses, we discovered one virus which is very close related to Hannibal virus and so it cross-reacted but not cross-neutralized with Hendra virus. We have data to show it shared the same cellular sort of entry receptor. Yet, in the two systems we use, ferrets and the guinea pigs, both are 100% lethal for Hendra nipper. This new virus called the CEDA virus does nothing. So we thought that's a really good opportunity to do comparative sort of pathogenesis. Okay, so that's just the first part, you know, I mean, in terms of bat uh, they have more than 1,000 different species, and they come in all sorts of size and shapes, and you know, I always sort of, in our lab, you have a, I have a large group of 30 people, so they have a debate. Some people thinking bats are cute, other thinking, you know, bats are ugly, and I said, I don't have a personal judgment on this. <laughs> to me, is that uh, bats is really a black hole, you know, huge black hole. They're fascinating in terms of, if you go deep, in their biology, their ability to handle viruses, but uh, I think uh, we really know nothing about bats. So that comes to my sort of the second part of the talk is really just a question. 
Y bats, okay? And uh, among the bat virologists that we debate, you know, in international meetings, we debate among ourselves all the time. So I think, you know, there are lots of different hypotheses, but it came down to these two major camps of thought. One is to say it's a numbers game. I mean, you already said 20% of mammals, 20% mammals are bats, so you should have 20% all mammalian viruses are from bats, and we're not even close to that. And the second group sort of thinking that uh, after 80 million years of separation from land mammal, and they may have evolved with the pathogens, and then develop this sort of more symbiotic relation, if you like. You know, they can peacefully live together better than other mammals. So this is, of course, it's a very big call. And uh, so this has been around for a while. And then last year, I think uh, maybe a year before, I was approached by Malik Paris, you know, as a guest editor for the current opinion in virology. So it's a new journal, and they invite to review papers, and he want me to be a little sort of a thought provocative, you know, to say to write a review just really address the question of why bats. So I invited uh, two other co authors. So we go from sort of mass extinction to biodiversity and try to look at the mitochondria, maybe there's a specific stuff. So that so for those of you that you're interested, you can read the the, the review papers because I don't have time to go through all the aspects we discussed. But in terms of maybe bats is special in harb harboring different viruses, we have some suggestive evidence, if you like. The first thing, of course, we have BSA-4 facility, and I have the largest collection of deadly viruses. So we try to do infection experiment, challenge experiment. So we did like, the, you know, you can get Nipple virus come from Malaysia, challenge into Australian bats, Australian virus challenge into Malaysian bats, or Chinese the SARS virus into Australian bats, all sorts of different combinations. And the failure rate is 100%. We could not even get temperature in bats, just, you know, nothing happens, okay? And we're putting in doses that they can kill horses, you know, 10 times to 100 times more than the dose required to kill horses, but nothing happens in the bats. And then I think more and more evidence now from our group and internationally that suggests that persistent infection, both at the individual and population level, could be maybe more uh, 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 prevalent than other mammals, at least for these three different families. And that's further supported by our work I'm going to touch a little bit later on, is that uh, in the last three years we spent a lot of effort to try to establish primary cell lines from different bat species. And every time we try, we will get a persistent infected virus from uh, looks healthy tissue. And, uh, and that's not unique from our group, Japanese group found the same. And then I think uh, you know, people blame us, that you guys publish science nature papers and claiming bats are the sort of reservoir of hosts, and everybody now jump onto the bat wagon, you know. And on a weekly basis, like today I was sent another paper and the last week I had another one. So on a weekly basis now, if you search for bat and the viruses, you will find at least one publication claiming that they have detected novel viral sequence from a bat in Australia, in Philippines, in USA, anywhere, you know, okay. The other thing is that not only their detection rate is higher, but the genetic diversity. Sometimes you can get from the same bat. If you sacrifice bat, you get a similar viruses, but with different sequence coexist in the same individual. And uh, anecdotally, and our data also support that, is that uh, not only diverse virus, but uh, you are able to find the ancient lineages, the, the common ancestors, if you like, of modern sort of mammalian virus, at least for the three families we are most interested. Okay, so I'm quickly just going to run through some of the data, you know. Today, I think I tried to go through the story rather than the detail of the data. So this is from the review paper, you know, go for coronaviruses, you know. And I, I have never worked on coronavirus, but I think that uh, I have been told a story in past the sort of international congress, people don't want to talk to coronavirus because it's not sexy enough. Coronavirus never caused severe disease in humans, so people don't pay much attention. So after SARS, the story has really changed. So the blue color indicates the coronaviruses that are, has been discovered in the last 50 to 60 years from human and livestock. The red color indicates the ones that are discovered in the last three or five years from bats. You know? So you can see the genetic diversity. And so the Hong Kong group in 2007 even went all the way to claim that uh, they are confident that all modern mammalian viruses actually evolved from ancestors in bats. Okay, so they, they have some evidence too for that. And the same group in Hong Kong, Malik's group, did uh, something for human astrovirus, or for, for astrovirus, and they got the same conclusion. 
the red color indicate the astrovirus in the last 50 years that uh, various groups has identified from human and livestock, and the black color now is the ones from bats. When you do things like that, I think you get a criticism to say you are targeting bats and your surveillance, you know, internationally, everybody, PhD student, postdoc, everybody is looking for virus in bats. So of course you're going to find more. So what happens if you do a control study? And so that's to the credit of Malik's group, they did the exact that. In Hong Kong, because this is where they sort of, the coronavirus group was very strong and the astrovirus. So what they did is they sampled six white life sort of, uh, uh, six uh, bat species and six rat species, all white uh, population in Hong Kong. And uh, same PhD student, exactly the same PCR procedure, did in the same lab, and they came with this kind of data. So astrovirus, much more, or more in bats than rats, and the coronavirus, nothing to compare, you know. So, okay, so if you do that, then the criticism is to say you only look at the two families, what are about other sort of families, and then just a few months ago, this was published in Nature Communication. It's our sort of collaborator from Germany, Christian Jostin, who played a major role in identifying uh, SARS virus in human. So this is a huge collaboration internationally, you know, uh, lots of groups. And uh, they sampled close to 10,000 individuals, animals, bats and rodents, represent almost 120 different wildlife species. So this is now focused on the family of Paramyxoviridae, which is sort of uh, most closely related to our research. And uh, now they claim they had found a 66th novel putative Paramyxovirus species, which is a headache for me because currently I'm the chair of the ICTV on Paramyxoviridae, and I don't like to do classifications based on the 400 uh, nucleotide sequence. So I told them already, I'm going to refuse any proposal until you have a live virus or full genome sequence at least. So hopefully that 66 will drop down to maybe six uh, viruses, but uh, you know. But the conclusion I think nevertheless is valid is that bats harbor a huge genetic diversity. So I'd like to sort of bring your attention to two, I think, of the major discoveries. One is that uh, they discovered a mumps virus. You know, for any human virologist in the audience, Mumps and measles has been considered as human virus for as long as you know, uh, 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 the virology exists. So now, these guys are claiming, no, mumps is a bat virus. They have found something, in, of course, again, it's 400 nucleotide sequence in the L gene, which is highly conserved, which is 97% identical to human mumps virus. Now that's, even the human mumps virus themselves vary more than that, okay? So I think that that's a pretty important discovery. The second is the same conclusion they draw as the Hong Kong group is to say that for the two major subfamily in the paramyx of Viridae, they are convinced that the ancestors of both subfamily virus come from bats, not rodents. So they imply is that bats is the origin of more than paramyx of viruses, okay? So this is the same as the Hong Kong group claiming that coronavirus and astroviruses all come from. So, just gave you a flavor, the red indicates the bat viruses, the black indicates the human or other mammals. So it's, again, it's a huge difference. Okay, so then the question is that uh, are bats sort of restrict as reservoir of these three major families? And then people start looking for other viruses. And this is the first paper out of maybe another two coming out of from the richest group in Hawaii. And now they found that uh, bats are also reservoir for Hunter virus, which is traditionally thinking it uh, only exists in rodents as the natural reservoir. And then, of course, that one had a huge impact when it came out, is that uh, now what we have is that in South America, at least uh, that's only the place people have looked for, is found uh, a distinct lineage of the flu A virus from bats. Now, Eddie Holm, who is doing this kind of uh, 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 virus evolution, told me that uh, they have more data to demonstrate that the genetic diversity they have discovered for flu A virus in microbats, just a few different species in South America, is already much greater than all the viruses we have been studying from human, birds, ducks, you name it, pig, you know, or horses. So again, it's pointed to maybe that very ancient lineage has been circulating in the bat population for a long, long time. So this is uh, our little collaboration with the Chinese group, and now we have expanded to include the AD Holmes group is to look at retroviruses. Uh, 
So the black are the ones that uh, the previous discovered the retrovirus, and as you could uh, imagine, the mammalian virus were clustered very closely, and then the avian retrovirus will be a bit more distant related. And then, so these are the limited numbers that we, uh, the Chinese did the micro and we did the mega bats, and as you can see, the micro bats, they still cluster with the mammals, but uh, it's a bit more distinct. What we were totally surprised was this one from the Australian black flying fox. You know, you have a retrovirus, looks like even more distant related than the avian stuff. That I am not a retrovirologist, uh, you know, so it's just uh, sort of very surprising to get this kind of data. Okay, so really sort of uh, we have anecdotal evidence to suggest that maybe that is special in terms of way of harboring virus and uh, being a really good reservoir for the virus. You know, it has coexisted maybe for 80 million years at least. So about five years ago, we had a, a brainstorming of my senior scientists in my group uh, to say, you know, we were doing really pretty successfully with discovering and characterizing virus and when we went ahead with developed diagnostic vaccine therapeutics. But uh, I think if we think of bats are special in terms of harboring virus, then maybe we should spend some of our resource attention to the host, okay? So we, we split 50-50 and I sort of established a, a group, a genomics group and a bat immunology group but obviously it's not easy because there's nothing out there, you know. Even if you want to measure IgM response in bats, you have to produce this uh, anti-IgM antibody yourself because there's zero reagent you can buy off the shelf, you know. So with that, we will focus on virus bat interface. So I'm going to present these future directions as both challenges and opportunities. The first challenge is that we're dealing with wildlife and we're dealing with this virus all classified as BSF4, you know. So the first challenge is, can we have a bat colony in a BSF-4 lab, you know, and our an animal ethics group made it very clearly, no, you are not allowed to do that, you know, so, so we are struggling, so we don't have sort of clean colonies we can work with, and, uh, but one thing I think is sort of, uh, you know, our group was uh, uh, pretty lucky is that we have the world's largest biocontainment facility, so this is the Australian Animal Health Laboratory. You know, if you have been to any of the BSF-4 facilities, most of the BSF-4s are sort of designed to have one corner or one floor seat off and as a BSF-4, whereas uh, our building is the whole box was uh, built as a BSF-4. So it's 100 meters that way, 100 meters that way. So 10,000 square meters, maybe 100,000 square feet for you guys, and five stories. So it's the largest PC3, PC4 facility in the world. And you have this double L-type doors. Every layer you go through is negative pressure, okay? So you have to open door and wait for this close before you can open the second door. And I calculated by the time I retire, I will be spending 30, uh, three months just waiting for the doors to close and open. <laughs> so, so this is the sort of, if you do a vertical section, you know, this is the, really only one floor is for working, so the animal and the labs, you know. And the two are air handling. Air comes in, is a filter once, goes out, filter twice. For PC4, PC3 operation, the air is incinerated at a thousand degrees C. And then the sewage collection and the sewage treatment. You know, for any of you close to Melbourne, I think it was to, to pay a visit. It's just a science fiction star stuff, you know. It's very, very complicated engineer-wise. Okay, so we have, you know, different BSF-4 facilities. So the small ones we use for virus culture to do imaging the larger ones that we can do challenger experiment, and there's no animal too big or too small. We have done challenge of SARS in this uh, micro bat seven grams. We're doing a conduct a nipper and a handle vaccine trial in horses, you know, in BSF-4. Imagine, you know, cut open the brain after a BSF-4 pathogen, you know. It's a lot of training and a lot of planning. So usually I say we have to do at least 20 meetings before we do experiment, and the 19 of the meetings is about safety and the one is about science, you know. So it's a really a uh, huge challenge. And uh, we just spent $10 million to build a new facility within the box. Now we have an expanded BSF-4 facility. I think they will be world first because what we have is that the imaging stuff in BSF-4 can be operated at the for scientists in the BSF-3 compartment, and we have this bulletproof and the airtight windows you can see through but it's a negative pressure and it's uh, regulated. Okay, so the second challenge is that, as I said, you know, total lack of knowledge in the research tools in 
bad immunology and bad biology in sort of uh, general. We even don't have IgM reagents. But we made a decision to say, in this day and age, if you really want to seriously study a new species, you may better start from the genomics. And, uh, and that was like uh, four years ago, and I still could not afford to sequence the genome just by my group. So I went, you know, internationally, and I was uh, lucky enough to mobilize five institutes from three nations, the Beijing Genome Institute, now one of the biggest uh, genomics institutes, ourselves, Chinese Academy of Science in Wuhan State of Virology, the Naval Med Medical Research Center in Bethesda, and the uh, Uniform Service Universe uses also in the U U.S. So we just completed that early this year. We finished all the annotation, and the manuscript is currently being uh, uh, reviewed by one of the major journals. So I don't have the liberty to tell you too much about the data, but I think I just to summarize to say that it's pretty exciting because it really give us the, the confidence that so that, that might be a good model system to study the virus host interaction, the cancer biology, DNA damage, you know, the uh, aging process, okay. Yeah, so to do the bad sort of virus interaction, we are applying sort of different approach. This is more like a hypothesis driven to say, these are the molecules we know already is pretty important for virus host DNA immune response. So maybe we should just follow this and look if first, are they molecules all there in the bat population? That at least the two different genomes we have sequenced. If they are, uh, you know, are they functionally the same, okay? So we have some data and we have some publication of others will be coming out. I'll just highlight maybe just one or two of them. The first is that we went for the interferon, you know, so this is considered to be, when it was discovered, considered to be the panacea for every viral infection. It's a broader spectrum. It's antiviral, it's very important, okay? And we still don't know, you know, maybe we should talk to immunologists here, is that uh, in human and mouse, we have 13 subtypes of interferon alpha, okay? They obviously function slightly differently and they have some redundancy. And the first surprise is when we through the, go through the genome sequence, we only find three really sort of sequences suggest could it be interferon, and then you look at the expression only Two of them are, looks like pseudogenes, and the one is sort of expressed. But even that one expressed, maybe our reagent is not good enough that we have a clear sort of message RNA detection that we're still struggling with the protein detection. And from the message RNA, it looks like it's not inducible. Now, one of the hallmarks of interferon response is the induction, you know, upon induced by, you know, LPG, uh, uh, poly-IC or other sort of uh, uh, molecules, or during viral infection, you have a huge sort of uh, 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 increase in production. And uh, in bats, that's not happening, at least in the different cell lines we have tried. So we don't understand what that means. We have a hypothesis, but I don't want to share here. Secondly is that uh, we have this uh, type three interferon. You know, type three interferon was much more recently discovered. And uh, in human, the human and the mouse, its function is still being debated because they're very similar like type one. So. I think one hypothesis thinking that type three is almost like the insurance sort of policy that if type one fails, then type three comes up, okay? But in bats, looks like it's the reverse. I already said type one is not inducible. It has a basal level expression, but type three is highly inducible and very early on it switch, switch on during sort of stimulation of viral infection. I have to emphasize this all really exciting but preliminary sort of uh, uh, findings. I, I don't think that the virus batch interaction is as simple as just the two different interferons, okay? The last one, I was talking to Brian about this new sort of uh, uh, bat vi herpes virus, you know. So this is one of the herpes virus. We sacrifice healthy bats, looks completely healthy, and we sacrificed and took 14 organs to culture primary cells. And from the lung, after four passages, we saw CP and we isolated this uh, 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 herpes virus, so we thought we should try to do a full lens genome sequencing. And to our surprise, that uh, we found the large numbers of different families of homologs for this immune invasion genes, if you like, invasion genes, if you like. The most surprised one is that in other DNA, large DNA virus, that the homologs of uh, MHC class one has been discovered, but has never, there has never been any sort of virus encoding MHC class two, and this is the first one. So I'm trying to, you know, link with Brian here just to do some collaboration. 
And the uh, cell line I have mentioned a few times already because bats as a model system to study wildlife, protect it, and if you want to get large numbers into BSS-3, BSS-4, it's just not practical and it's impossible. So three years ago, we made a decision to say we want to invest some sort of resource into this because the cell lines will be very essential, both for virus isolation and for basic studies. Because ATCC at that time only carried one bat cell line, and when we bought it, it's just useless. That grows very slow, and we could not do any study with it. So we decided to do it ourselves. And uh, it's a lot of trying because we want to optimize this. And so the first paper came out in 2009. We used our Australian, the large black flying fox, as the model system. And then we optimized the system, and then we went ahead to develop other four. Three of them are micro bats in Australia. This Eidolon is the flu bats in Africa that's suspected to be the uh, one potential reservoir for the Hannibal virus in Africa. So we were interested to use that to isolate live virus in Africa. And uh, to our surprise is that, uh, you know, we got uh, more requests for bat cell line than anything we have published. So we got lots, lots of requests. So it looks like it's pretty hot, you know. And uh, not only the scientists were interested, but I think uh, other people were interested as well. During the, the investigation last year, 2011, we had an 18 outbreak, remember? So normally my group is a lab-based. We collaborate with field people. But with 18 outbreaks, our field scientists was really stretched. So I sent my group to the field, and we thought we want to test our these new viruses, you know? So bats goes out dark, you know, and it comes back before, you know, daylight. The first thing they do, they do a shower, you know, so the urine shower. And the urine, bat urine is for other people, you know, you don't want to get near with, uh, close by. For us bat virologists, I always say this is a liquid gold, you know, so you can do gold mining there. And that's what we did. We, you know, we observed their sort of habitats and we know the colony when they come back, mostly where the urine drop is. And we put it usually is around 20 to 30, you know, clean plastic sheet, nighttime and in the morning. We go there, try to collect, you know, if there's a rain, then we just gave up and the next day we try it again. One particular experiment I like to mention, so we get this, you know, freeze, put it into transport media and put it into sort of dry or liquid nitrogen, get back to the lab as soon as possible. And last year, this is the world record. We had 47 jobs of urine samples. Now, each job we think is from individual bat. It could be contaminated from two or three bat, but let's just say, 47 examples, and we made 37 live virus isolations. You know, I was talking to Brian today, you know, Ian Lipkin always says, there's a lot of virus hunters there doing PCR sequence analysis. Very few have succeeded in isolate virus from bats, and our group certainly is one of them. And, uh, you know, 37 isolations from 47 examples. I don't think you can get that from rodents or humans, you know, you can't. So four are hand isolates. We have multiple rubrovirus. virus. This is, uh, by the way, is a, a genus in the same family with paramyxovirus, many of them normal, 10 adenovirus, and Brian, if you want adenovirus, I can give you tons of these, you know. And then multiple isolations from a single samples, again, indicates that the prevalence level is really high. Yeah, so we haven't sequenced all of them yet, it's just keep us really busy, you know. And this is only the 37 samples, or 47 samples we collect out of 500. So we stopped doing this because we thought we couldn't handle any more viruses. And we were rewarded more than just, you know, as scientists, you get a publication in science and in whatever fields of virology, you get really excited. But I think nothing beats that your work is cited by a Hollywood blockbuster. I don't know how many of you have seen this movie, Contagion. All right, yeah. I don't know if you noticed that one, you know, uh, uh, little, in the middle, the virus was isolated. They tried to develop a vaccine and the, they could not grow enough. The virus kills every cell line. And until, you know, the, the Dr. Sussex from San Francisco claims that he succeeded, and that he succeeded using use the bat fetal cells from a lab in Geelong. Now, for you, it means nothing. For my lab, <laughs> that means, uh, you know, the, the, the movie was uh, sort of premiered in, in, in USA, I think it was August, and uh, in Australia was uh, in October. So uh, my whole lab, you know, 30 people invite their children, their partners, their cousins, you know, we went for the premiere, uh, you know, so this is a big <laughs> event uh, to get into Hollywood. And this is all because that man, you know, in Lipton, in Lipkin was the, the science advisor for the, for the movie. When he was shooting the movie, he was also publishing the paper, tried to, you know, prospectively they identify a new Ebola-like uh, filovirus from Spanish bats, and they could not grow that. And so they imported our 
sort of virus and put it into sort of CDC and try to grow it up. So he sort of incorporated that into the movie. And the movie is basically was based on the nipple virus anyway. It's a virus from bats to pigs and uh, to humans. So anyway, this is a little bit of celebration for our group. Okay, so the last two parts of the challenge is, as I said, you know, the, the way we're doing is hypothesis driven. Say, we look at the t TOLAC receptors, we look at the interferons, what happens if bats has a totally novel pathways? We will miss that, right? So we now doing discovery driven approach in parallel. What we are doing is that the first is to use all technology driven. Of course, this is a high seek sort of. Uh, so we are the only group. We have all the viruses in the bat cell lines. So we are doing mock and then doing infections is hand SARS Ebola at different time points do the sort of rna seq stuff and really try to identify commonly up or down regulated, uh, especially on these unique orphan genes that uh, there's no orthologue has been identified as playing a role in virus host interaction. So that work is just finished the sequencing and the bioinformatics is working on that. This is a bit more difficult is the genome wide sort of SI library, you know, we can sort of, we have just complete the first BSA 4 screening and, and people have done that with hep C, HRV and all these kind of things. But to do that screening in BSA 4 took us 12 months really to work out the logistics and the optimization. The other challenge is that we have done the human sort of library screening. What we really want is to build our own bat library, you know, so now we have the genome sequence. All we need is to find a few million dollars to build that sort of library. And then once we have that, it will be really exciting to compare the human and the bat, you know. So we have virus that are kills in human and are totally harmless in bats. So that's the thing we're going to do. The last bit of challenge is that in all these studies now, I mean, the one health push is obviously pretty obvious to what we do. So, you know, the virus comes from wildlife, amplifying livestock, sometimes it causes a direct impact, sometimes an indirect impact livestock, and eventually, you know, kills humans. So the one health approach is obviously pretty essential. So that's, I think, in this context, you know, I was approached by Duke to go to head this sort of uh, uh, unit there. So I thought for myself, you know, although we work on zoonotic viruses, but my laboratory in Australia is mainly in wildlife and livestock, whereas in Singapore, I can really work with the human clinicians very closely. So this is the, we have international collaboration. I have very strong collaboration in China in the States and then through Cambridge University, we have a station in Ghana as well. The only content we're missing is really in South America in terms of bat virus research. And this is the One World One Health logo, and I think that we need to add this one day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the take home sort of message is uh, bats carry a lot of viruses, and uh, you know, some of them are highly lethal in non bat hosts, but totally harmless in bats. We have very little, I love to see zero understanding really, you know, the, the virus bat, we think that there's something unique interaction going on and we like to understand this. And the last part I don't have time to go into it is that, uh, you know, from evolution point of view, that, that the viruses which are killing humans could be really good for the evolution of bats. And so you can think of the, you know, potential advantages, why they uh, can uh, coexist. So I was really excited. I was sort of thinking along that line in 2007, I thought this Nature publication by Skip Virgin's group from uh, Washington University of St. Louis. So what they have basically is that uh, two sort of genetically identical colonies of mice. One have herpes virus persistent infection. One is considered to be healthy and clean. And then they challenge with two different bacteria, lethal challenges. And the one with the herpes persistent infection, you know, survives. So obviously that cannot be adaptive immunity because we're talking about virus persistent infection protect against lethal bacterial challenge. So, so he came up with this sort of term which I like very much is a symbiotic enhancement of innate immunity. So if you think of bats carry so many viruses without causing disease, then that enhancement might be playing a very important role there. Okay, so the last thing that uh, I always try to advise people that we get a lot of media attention and the bad conserv uh, conservation people and bad biologists uh, always say, you guys are the evil, you know, you think of that. So, you know, uh, you really sort of picture bats as a, a evil and I said, no, we don't believe so. I mean, it's not bats fault, it's humans fault. Bats and the virus has been around for a long, long time. So the question of uh, are bats the, the good guy or the bad guy, I say it depends on the culture. You know, in the Western culture, mostly bats are picture, depicted as, you know, ghost, evil, death, and darkness. 
whereas there's a few cultures, I think there's the exception, one of them is the Chinese culture. So the Chinese culture, oh, this one does not show up. The character of uh, bats and the fortune is very similar, and the pronunci pronunciation is also the same. So basically, bats are considered as fortune and happiness and uh, longevity. You know, so that's has been there for a thousand years of uh, history, that's the case. So I said, as a Chinese, I'm a strong believer bats are good. That sort of is the, the symbol of fortune, and my sort of uh, fortune for science took off ever since I studied bat viruses, you know, so I believe in that one. Okay, so to conclude, I think, you know, what we, the slogan in my group now is to say bats are good, we can learn lots from bats, so learning from bats is uh, going to be the, the focus of our research in the next uh, few years to come. And we can learn the, from them how to control infections maybe, or even fighting cancer, or living longer because they live really long. Okay, so last thanks to all the collaborations that I have was fortunate enough to do lots of collaboration with. Uh, I usually don't list names, I just list organizations I collaborate with. And this is the group that I have right now. And uh, Ellie was the PhD student. When she left the group, she said that this is a, such a you know, lovely group. You guys should have a name and a logo. So she designed one before she left. We call ourselves the Bat Club. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I think that, that depends on what you define as a mutation. As I said, the hand virus, for example, you know, every outbreak we will isolate 10 different hand virus and none of them are identical, okay? So, you know, they're obviously evolving and mutating on a regular basis. And whether that, your second part of the question is whether that provides an advantage whether for the... Whether that's providing an advantage for the mutation of RNA? Well, that's our theory is that the selection in the bats is not as strong in like human. If the virus comes to human, like the SARS virus, for example, it goes from human civets to, oh sorry, bat civets to human. Once it gets to human, it has to go through a very rapid evolution. And by stage three, most of the SARS virus from sort of each cohort is very, very similar. Whereas in bats, I'm saying that, uh, you know, I don't want to jump to conclusion, but anecdotally, the Chinese have isolated SARS lock virus from single bats, and they identify three different sequences. So, yeah. Yes, please. Uh, two questions. So, first of all, is there any evidence for uh, human infection with Cedar virus? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So the first question is that uh, uh, to do with, uh, sorry, the first question. <laughs> See the virus. See the virus. I was thinking more thinking of the yeah, second question is more difficult, you know. The first five question is much easier to answer. We haven't done any human serology. I okay, you know, you know, I don't know about in the US, in Australia, our lab is always involved in national emergency response and my director is very politically astute and sensitive. I think he told me once that don't ask the question unless you can handle the answer. So, so this is the one area I love to do the human serological surveillance, but I need uh, the chief medical officer in Australia to approve for us. We're not even allowed to do that in horses. We have thousands of horse serum in our lab, and we, I love to survey horses first to see, because Hendra, we have surveyed thousands of horse serum, we haven't found any single asymptomatic horse seropositive. Okay, now if we do that for cedar, I think that maybe we get the answer before we even touch the human, all right? The second one is your, the, the white nose syndrome and the fungal sort of uh, infection. And uh, certainly that there are much less attention on bacteria infection and the parasite infection, fungal infection in bats. Although now they're starting to have a few reviews to coming out mainly really to associate the sort of the detection rather than disease, okay? So by in the one nose sort of syndrome, I think it's still interesting, you know, I'm not expert in that area, people are still debating 
fungal growth on the nose, definitely that's you know unquestionable. But whether that's pathogenic enough to kill the the, the host, that's still being debated. So it still falls within that sort of same argument that bats carries pathogens. That's you know no argument. Whether they can cause very severe disease at a frequency to other mammals, that's where people are sort of debating and arguing. So for the white nose syndrome, I think, uh, you know, whether the fungus is killing the bats, I think uh, the, the evidence is not, you know, 100% proven, yeah. I, I would say it's 99.9%. 99.9, mm -hmm. okay. I mean, from my perspective, yeah. they've satisfied Cox postulate with several bat species with DMICs, and there's no question that like 90% of the bats in is, eastern North, yeah. North America have been wiped out by GMICs. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't only infect around the nose, it yeah. affects the wings. Okay. And that's what's disrupting their hibernation pattern. So my question would be, mm -hmm. do you ever see GMICs disrupt ants in Australia? Do your bats hibernate in the same way? The no, Australian bats don't hibernate because the, the temperature, you know. Yeah. So they may be protected from it. Because these yeah. bats are coming out of hibernation yeah. in the winter and then um, coming out of the case yeah. and then there's nothing to eat. But the German group found identical sort of uh, uh, fungus, but don't cause disease, right? So in, in their bats. The yeah. bats yeah. differ, or the GMICs yeah. isolates mm -hmm. differ or both, but mm -hmm. for, the, for the American isolates, yeah. GMICs, Cox postulates, and what's that? Yeah. The other thing I think maybe I should emphasize is definitely there are viruses which kill bats as well, you know, like uh, uh, rabies, and uh, you know, and there's a uh, arena virus that if you give it a high dose, it still kills. So I think. Uh, I don't want to give you the impression that it's totally resistant to any pathogens. It's just that I think it uh, seems to be more resistant to more pathogens, not you know completely resistant to all pathogens. Yeah. Just, I mean, along these lines, do you see um, ecologically large dioxin bat populations from viral disease? See, that's one thing that uh, that's one thing we have been really digging into literature and talking to bat biologists. The bat research is kind of interesting. Up until now, it's all done by ecologists and the conservation people. So that certainly there are die-off. In Australia, even we had a die-off just 10 years ago, but it was attributed to the, the drought and the, to, to poison. There was no infectious agent involved, but how hard people have looked, you know. You can yeah. imagine for a small, small species that makes it so having to fly, yeah. you're probably closer on the edge of disaster yeah. than, say, yeah. And so anything that um, reduces your ability to get out and cover the distance, you, yeah. may, um, you, know, you may, you may, um, catastrophe may occur. Soon. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, we're looking at the bat immunology part, but I think at the bat ecology, certainly, there are people like the conservation sort of a group, the group, now it's, they call it a global health alliance, I think they change the name every year, you know. So these are the group that are really looking at the ecology drivers for, uh, Bad bone viruses, yeah. Tom, one more question. Two. <laughs> yes. How do you improve your past research if you can go back? How do I improve my past research if I can go back? That's a good question. I think, uh, well, I think uh, that uh, in terms of the, the virus sort of hunting aspects, I think. Uh, you know, we cannot do much better because the, the, equi uh, the, the technology we have is all more than technology when we discover, you know, and things like that. I think uh, if I had a uh, time to go back, uh, maybe I would have started the, the bat biology and bat immunology a little bit earlier so we can build up the reagents so that we can do something at least, you know. And uh, we're, we're really ramping up very quickly right now, but still I think uh, we are no way near uh, where we want in terms to do virus host interaction, yeah. Sorry, yeah. uh, I was saying, uh, um, bat, bat guano is yeah. actually a big business for yeah. a while, and I wonder if it's still in some places where one could survey the population, the human population yeah. who's harvesting the guano, yeah. and whether they have unusual respiratory illnesses. Yeah, have. yeah. They haven't, I think, uh, I haven't seen a report of surveying sort of people handling bat guano, but they have surveyed a bat guano itself, and they just, you know, there's quite a few publications comes out. And they're just loaded with the uh, viral sequences, whether you know they are not live virus, and uh, and the virus covers from mammalian virus, plant virus, insect viruses. Some of them are maybe bad viruses, others are come from the food, you know. So, but they are, the CDC did a, a serology of all bad sort of handlers they can find voluntarily, 
and, uh, and, but they only monitored a few sort of high profile viruses and the serology was all negative. So it looks like the virus jumping species from bats direct to human is not sort of as easy as you think. Having said that, you know, Nipper can do that and uh, the Malacca virus I did not talk, which is a real virus, did just like that, back to human followed by human to human transmission. Yeah. Dr. Lang, we're very fortunate to have you now part of the Duke family. Hope to see you back soon. Please join me in thanking them for a very informative.